what a blessing to be here and be able to come and celebrate. And we have had such beautiful weather, and uh, it really is a blessing to be among you all. But my, my wife and my kids right now are, are back in the room because they're not feeling too well. So I, I'd like to start out just to pray for my wife and family. My wife's been a, a great help and uh, made a lot of sacrifices so that, um, so that I would be able to even just speak and, and many other things, and I'm so thankful for her. Um, if you join me real quick. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for um, the family you've given me, Lord. I pray that you would bless my little children, uh, heal them, and my wife too, Lord, and anyone else here who's uh, fighting off any sickness, Father. Just we, we want to ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would help and help us, Father, to uh, be in health and, and uh, have strength. We know that, Lord, it's your, it's your will that we would prosper as our soul prospers, as, as you inspired in your scripture, Lord, that um, we would be able to, to serve you, Father. And we just thank you so much for this time here. I uh, ask that you would bless this message Lord, I was already, as already was prayed for me, Father. And um, we just give you this time, Lord, um, to, to open our minds, Lord, to your word. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like to start by reading Matthew, chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Well, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Praise the Lord. You know, the relationship that we have with God is one where he is not far off. He's near to us. When Jesus spoke those words, uh, there was a certain type of uh, block between the people and God because the priesthood had put in more traditions of man and, and things that would cause the, the people to think, well, they're not so close to God. They have to do these certain things in order to get God's approval, so to speak. But the relationship that God wanted with us is one where we can ask him, we seek him. We have a, a, a living, kind of breathing, face-to-face -face kind of relationship that he wants us to have, where he's working in us. And to have this kind of a relationship with him, to be able to ask ask him and to receive, we need to first see what is, how do we have this relationship with him? Because like if we, if we don't have any kind of relationship with someone and then we go and talk to them, well, they don't really know us, right? And they're like, well, who, who are you? But when you have a relationship with someone and you ask them something, then they know who you are and they, they respond to you. And we're going to look at the scriptures and dive into this topic of asking, seeking, and knocking. Because we've probably heard this scripture a lot of times, right? But we need to, I believe, we need God to awaken us and consider the areas that we can pursue him more, areas where we need to ask him more areas where we can put these things into practice in our lives. If we've ever felt like you've been a bit disconnected from God, if you've ever felt like that, how do I truly, how do I truly seek God and how can I have his presence be more in my life? We'll look into those things today. Because we don't want to sit around and, and wish for things 
to happen in our lives. We don't wanna just say, well, I wish that God was doing this. I wish that God was doing that with me. We want to ask and receive. We want to seek and find and to knock and to have the door opened. And so let's discover like this invitation that God has today for us to ask and seek and knock. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 18, and I'm gonna read there from verses one to eight. Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now there's a lot of, a lot packed into this parable because one thing, um, we can see God is not an unjust judge, but here he gives an example of an unjust judge just judge, to show that even the unjust judge, when he's continually asked and asked, he finally gets weary, and, and even he will give in to the needs of this, this widow. But we can say, what about those that are crying out to him and day and night? So here, there's an emphasis not just like crying out once, right, but day and night, like you really, we really are asking, we're coming before God, we're serious um, about it. Sometimes when we ask things, we just ask and then go away. Well, if the problem's still there, usually we, we shouldn't, we're probably still gonna keep asking, but sometimes we, we don't get the answer right away and we just think, well, guess that's not God's will and just go away. But here he gives an example of how, how much shall God avenge his own elect to cry out day and night. So how does he want us to come? Does he want us to just, you know, say at one time, I think he really wants us to, to be sincere and, and put our hearts into what we're asking, not just a, a one and done. But he said that he will avenge him speedily, nevertheless, oh, go here, Helen, I, here it was, I was going to say, though he bears long with them, that's, what, that's the next part, it says, cry out day and light, though he bears long with them. So Though he bears along with them implies, well, maybe they don't get what they're asking right away, right? And we know that, um, you know, God didn't say to just pray long prayers so that we could just be heard a lot of, for a lot of words. So not like that we just have to just say the same thing over and over again for a really long time. But at the same time, we know that he's bearing along with us. So then what is it that he's... Is it the problem with him or with us or with what we're supposed to learn? A lot, oftentimes, it's, it's definitely not with him. <laughs> the problem is with us and oftentimes what we're supposed to learn. So when we're not immediately faced with the answer, then we need to examine ourselves, examine our motivations, examine some of these things that we're going to take a look into in this, some of these next verses coming out. We know that the Bible does say to pray without ceasing. In, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, uh, it's in a section there where the Thessalonians are given some instructions at the end and telling them to rejoice and to praise, pray without ceasing, giving thanks and everything. That these things all are leading to the sort of uh, uh, attitude that God wants us to have. And... When it says pray without ceasing in the middle of there, um, it's, it's not necessarily like we're walking around like with our, with our hands lifted up and, pray, and praying constantly. 
but it's saying that we're in this attitude of rejoicing and praying, praying uh, without ceasing, meaning that we have the conversation open. It's like if you're, you know, walking along with your friend, um, you're not necessarily constantly speaking to him, but you have that, the, the line is open. You know, you can say things, he's right there with you. And so, um, we also see in Ephesians 6, 17 and 8, or Ephesians 6, when it talks about putting on the armor of God, so being prepared, that at the end of that section where it says uh, there in 17 and 18, it says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so there, it's something about being ready, being ready. You have the armor of God, and you're always there with that attitude of praying, waiting for the answer that God has for us. So in all of our circumstances, our faith and our regular lives are not meant to be, you know, like disconnected where we've got our, you know, our faith lives here and then we've got, you know, our work lives here and everything. We do have to focus on different things, but we're supposed to have that line of communication open. So if something's not going right, then instead of causing it, us to kind of get bent out of shape about the problem that we're in, that we can find peace from God. We can find um, confidence that despite us not knowing the answer or knowing how to solve the problem that we're in right then, that God is going to bring about a solution for us because we're trusting in his salvation. We're trusting him who is, um, who is with us. So there's a persistence in prayer, but there's also the dependence that we need to have on God. Now, I want to give an example of someone uh, who had, there's a bunch of examples that I could think of, of persisting in prayer. But one example uh, that I wanted to bring up is from a man named Dave Rosenthal. He was born with a serious case of eczema. Uh, his mother was also born with eczema. And he had not spent a lot of time with God, but he didn't know that part of the reason why that he had, his condition uh, was connected with not being spending a lot of time with God. And someone, he heard someone uh, preaching about faith and um, talking about how God still does miracles. And he told this man, Dave Rosenthal, that if he would repent and walk in a personal relationship with him and get close to God, that God would heal him. And so he heard a bunch of testimonies of people that had been healed, and he went up and was prayed for. And he heard this testimony of a, of a little boy who uh, had a condition where his mom uh, had to feed him certain enzymes before he ate. Every time, if he didn't eat those enzymes or take those enzymes before he ate, then he would throw up his food. He wouldn't be able to keep it down. And so he heard the testimony of this little boy who came and, and had heard the same uh, man speak for about four hours, and the little boy was convinced that he would, he would be healed if he went and prayed with this man. So he went and prayed with him, and the little boy, they were standing on the scripture that said, whenever you uh, ask, believe that you'll receive it and you'll have the things you ask for. And the little boy um, went up there, prayed with the the. Uh, the man speaking, and he went back and found his parents, and his parents said, oh, hey, let's go up to pray, because they didn't know he had went up to pray, and he said, we well, don't need to, I already prayed, and I'm, I, I'm healed, and, his, and this is a little boy, he's only five years old, and 
So his parents were like, well, we wanted to go up with you. And he said, well, but he didn't want to go. He said, no, we, we prayed, it's done. <laughs> so he went back, and his mom went to feed him and uh, was going to give him the enzymes. And or I said, okay, we need to take your enzymes. He said, no, I don't need the enzymes. I'm healed. And so his mom said, well, look, if you, if you take that and you throw up your food, I'm going to spank you. <laughs> and he said, okay, mom, that's fine. I'm not going to throw it up. And he ate the food, and he didn't, didn't have any more problems, didn't have to take the enzymes ever again. Now, Dave heard that, that uh, testimony in, during this time, and so he prayed, and so... He believed that God wanted him to, he had been taking a lot of medications and creams, and this has been a lifelong thing for him. He had, at various times, it flared up. When he was in, in, in uh, college, it flared up even worse. Um, times that, it, it's interesting, when he looked back at his life, times where he was even further from God, it seemed like he was flaring up the most. Well, um, he got rid of all these things, and the next morning when he first got started this whole thing, he woke up a little tight and had problems because his skin has had, had all these problems. And some of those things just provided some relief. But um, he fought a fight for many months. And it was more than 20, about 20 months before pretty much everything was gone except for a little bit on his toe. And then I think maybe almost six months to a year more for the last thing issue with the toe. But... Through that time, God showed him that the main reason why he had this problem that he couldn't get over was because he didn't spend time with God, that he didn't spend any time with him. He didn't know him. And it got much worse before it got better. When he stopped taking the creams after about a year, and he still had his whole body from head to toe now was just about covered with eczema. Um, some of the splotches, splotches were here and there before, but it almost covered his whole body. And he came in to the uh, preacher who had told him, and he said, you know, it doesn't appear to be working. And he said, <laughs> he said, repent, it always works. <laughs> I don't know, that's going to take some faith for me to see somebody in that condition and be like, it, it always works. When you see this man covered in sores, I'd be like, well, a bunch of people had told him, well, I, you know, I got a good doctor. They kept seeing him in getting worse and worse, and they cared about him. They wanted him to get some help. You know, I, got it. I got faith in this doctor. You can go here. But that wasn't where, and there's nothing wrong with going to a doctor, but that wasn't where Dave was. Dave had been to many doctors. He had tried health things uh, and a bunch of supplements and other things which had helped, but it still didn't get rid of his condition, didn't fix his condition. He had been in this condition his whole life long, and he had felt God saying to him when he was saying, well, well, should I continue this? He was saying, well, do you want to continue doing that your whole life? And now he had to, I mean, he had to go through some things to wait like this, right? Because, I mean, 12 months with sores all over your body, it reminded him of Job, although he wasn't Job in his life, but the fact that he was suffering in that kind of way with itching and um, so forth. But at the end of it, Dave, as he persisted and he spent time with God, Dave's healing came. And he came back and he said, well, he almost didn't know how he got healed when he finally got healed. He was like, well, there was all these things that he was trying to do to spend time with God, but he couldn't like pinpoint, well, what was it that, but he knew that it was God that healed him. And God brought that verse back to him uh, uh, about, or not that verse, but that what he had talked to him about spending time with him was that the, the main reason. So when it comes to perseverance, we can all identify, let's, let's think about something in our lives that we need to persevere for. Think about something that needs persistent prayer in our life. What is the personal struggle that we have? Maybe it's not a physical ailment of eczema, but maybe it's something else that's inhibiting us from being close to God and getting uh, an answer to, to something in our lives that we need, or for someone else, or possibly our career or some other thing that we need, or, or relationship issue or something. And let's pray about those things daily and be persistent and not give up and get closer to God. So let's continue now and look at 
um, how we can know God's will, how we can uh, walk in his will, and consider this in the world, whenever, uh, whenever we can do things independently, people look up to that. When, when we're able to uh, build things or do, do things and we're independent, they say, oh, he's, he's independent, he can do it. But here in these, this, these, in this uh, invitation that the Lord has given us to ask, and it will be given to you, seek, and you shall find. It's not a, uh, a question of independence, like that saying, okay, look, you know, just seek on your own strength, and you'll be able to do it. Just keep on going at it. Give it all you got. That's not the, the focus of it. The focus is to rec- recognize that with God, all things are possible. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So there is a connectedness that we need to have with Jesus to be able to bear fruit. And when he's told us to ask and you shall receive, these, he, he's talking about, as he said, um, as it says in the parallel account in Luke, that God will give the spirit to those who ask him. These are, he's talking about um, receiving from him things that are spiritual, receiving from him things that are also answers to our problems or other things too, but he's talking about through his power. And to do that, we need to be connected to him. We have to remain connected to him to produce spiritual fruit. And so that takes daily, that takes a commitment to God. And it means that we need to spend time with him in prayer. We need to spend time with him reading, reading the scriptures, knowing his will that's written for us there, to know that a dependence on God is a source of power. Dependence on God is not a source of uh, weakness where we have to be independent, do everything on our own, but it's a source of power because we're not then alone. We're, like it says, apart from him, we can do nothing, but with him, all things are possible. Let's turn over now to uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 through 8. My daughter quoted this whole chapter earlier this feast and was uh, really proud of that she's, God's given her ability to remember those things, those verses. Verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, and it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. So here, the focus here is our hearts toward him, our focus toward him, and not toward our own, our own understanding, not toward our own ways, our own desires, but it's putting the focus on, on him. So if we're, if we're asking if we're seeking him, if we're seeking his desires, then he is going to direct us, as this says. It's important for us to think about with God, he takes the abilities, he gives us abilities. It's not that we couldn't do anything because God created us. He said, have dominion over the earth. In, in Genesis and subdue it and so forth. And so God gave us abilities to, to, to build, to do things, right? But he amplifies those abilities when we give those abilities to him and uses them for a good purpose so that it will produce a good outcome because on our own, it will lead to selfishness and lead to uh, what does not produce any fruit. But abiding in him and 
trusting in him and, and following this, putting our hearts toward him, to lean on him, then, and acknowledging him in, all, in the things that we do, then he's going to direct us, and then we'll be able to have, our, have health as a byproduct, here it says, not being wise in our own eyes. It says it will be health to our flesh and strength to our bones. So by focusing on him doing the right thing, we'll have the health that we need, we'll have the answers to those physical problems that we have, but we'll be able to go and we'll be able to do things for others and, and accomplish things in his kingdom. So we have to get the focus off of our, us and the focus onto him. If, when I was in college, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go and do some, something for the Lord because, because I, I, I was turning to him. I had, turned, I had gotten rid of um, some of my own, like, things that I was seeking to understand the world. So I got rid of some of my own music. I got rid of things when I was, around the time I was baptized, I got rid of a bunch of stuff when I was 18. And going into college, um, I wanted God to use me. And I realized that I couldn't do anything myself. I didn't realize I didn't really have any, I have, didn't have any ability to do something great myself, but I wanted God to do something through me. And so there, I, I, um, I joined this, training called the Christian Leadership Academy. It was in uh, Arkansas that was starting up, and they had this idea they were going to go and uh, have people speak around the country on, on moral, moral subjects and on the Ten Commandments and certain things. And um, I went up there several times, like drove a few, five hours or so up there, and turned out it didn't, didn't happen uh, in the sense that they didn't actually get off the ground. There were some differences in, you know, logistics of how people were going to, whether they were going to stay where they spoke, whether they were going to do certain things. But I bring it up because it, there was a hunger that, or something that God had put there, a spark of a desire to, to go and be used by God. And though it didn't take off there, God still used that. And um, many years later, I, when I was single and I was in uh, working in Florida. I had worked in California. I moved to Florida. I was working there, and I uh, I started exercising. I started doing P90X, and I was about 30 days into it. And you know, I, I was like, I was thinking about that scripture, you know, physical exercise profits a little bit, but godliness profits in all things. And so I decided to stop my 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 P90X in the middle. Not to saying. Go ahead, you can do some P90X if you want. But I, I stopped in the middle, and I, and I started a fast, you know, which kind of killed the P90X. And um, I fasted for five days. And, you know, I, I was fasting because I wanted God to do something. I was there, I was working, and I had this, I, I was single, right? And there were a few places that I were, were, had found to go to worship the Lord, other people that were like-minded. I didn't know what God wanted me to do at the time. I wasn't married, didn't have any responsibilities. And so, um, so I, I was showing that I needed God to do something. When I fasted, I was, I didn't know what he was going to do or how he's going to do it. I just knew that I wanted to be used by him. And so I didn't really see anything happen right away. But I, I, that's the main thing I want to, I'm going to pick this back up, but let's go on a little bit first, and I'll pick this story back up in a little bit. I want you to think, though, about your life and areas where, where you have relied on God or areas where God is calling you to rely on him. Sometimes we don't know exactly what the calling God has for us is, but we have to make ourselves available, spend time with him so that we can find out what that is. And even when God brought some of these things to me that he wanted me to do at the time, um, it's like I didn't really know until they were happening almost. But then looking back, I could see that uh, he, he brought certain things about. Let's 
Let me go to, sorry, I just locked myself out here. But we know that by ourselves, in our own strength, we can do nothing. But as we said, uh, and as it says in Philippians 4.13, that through Christ, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we think about seeking God. We think about seeking. He says, seek and you shall find. In our seeking, we, we should think about also the instruction that we're given to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34, Jesus says, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the nations seek, for your heavenly Father knows that ye need all these things. But seek first the kingdoms of, kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, here there's this calling to seek first the kingdom, and again, all these things that we need will be added to us, just like we were reading in Proverbs that it said to uh, fear the Lord um, and depart from evil, where it said, uh, do not lean on your own understanding, trust the Lord with all your heart, right? Here it is again saying, don't worry, right? Don't worry, and saying that we should seek first his kingdom, Let's take a look at another place here in Colossians verses chapter uh, 3. I'm going to read the first two verses. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So when we're when we're thinking about just the next, uh, you know, goal that we have on the earth, and we're only f focused on that, then our perspective on what really matters is gets thrown off. Because what, when, when we, that's not to say that we don't need to set some goals, but it's to say that we want to set our mind, what is our end goal? We should keep that in mind because that's what gives us the power to do the things is, is God working through us to accomplish something that's a bigger goal that is his, a goal in his kingdom, not just that immediate task that we need to, to achieve. And so the anxiety that we have can go away and it's a remedy for the, the, the fear and the anxiety when we stay connected to the goal and through when we stay connected to the purpose that God has for us. And so this keeps our focus on him. And James, if we do have anything that we're focused on that we don't know how to do, we have this promise from God, though, that if we ask him, uh, that he'll give us the wisdom to do it. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed in the wind. And so here... Uh, we, if we have any needs, we can ask of God. It takes faith, and sometimes um, we, need, we need to spend time with God in order to be able to have that faith that he's going to give us the wisdom because he will give it to us, but if we doubt, it's likely because we're feeling self-condemned a lot of times. We know that uh, in Christ there is no condemnation. We feel condemnation whenever we we sin when we do things that we are, are contrary to God, but we know that he's greater than our hearts. He's able to change our hearts. We know that, that 
when we repent, we turn to him, that he forgives us and he gives us a conscience that's clear so that we can serve him, we can renew him because we know that his blood truly, as we just learned in the Day of Atonement, pays for and removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. When we set our mind on heavenly things, we spend time with God, it will give us uh, the faith to believe when we ask God in prayer. So I want to pick back up the story um, where I was working in Florida. And, you know, I was working full time, like I, was, I said at the time. I could have taken my time that I had available to go and try to further my career, try to maybe jump to a better, higher paying job that was more demanding, because my job wasn't super demanding at the time, wasn't the highest paying job. But I thought about that and I said, well, but, but I have time now where I could serve God outside of work. My job isn't so tough. I only have, it's a small engineering department, so I don't have a ton of communication going on, constantly bombarding me. I'm able to, uh, you know, to achieve the things that are asked of me and also innovate things because, you know, I was, it's another story, but I was really blessed to work on the things that I was interested in, in that job, and be able to, um, to innovate and, and, and do a lot of interesting new things that hadn't been done in the industry. But I wanted to do things for the kingdom. I didn't want to just take that extra time and just try to climb a career ladder. I wanted God to do something with my, the younger years of my life, and I was probably 24, 25 at the time. And so after that fast that I, that I, I did for five days, then sometime after that, as time went on, I met up with someone who had uh, a building that they that they got for their church, and they wanted to use it for other things besides just uh, their meeting at their church. And I had gotten these Bibles, actually, you know, a couple of years prior that I wanted to give out to people. And I had mentioned that to, to the uh, pastor at this church, and he said, why don't you host, why don't you host concerts at, at, at my church uh, on, you know, pick a different time that's, you know, when they're not meeting and host some concerts there and give out the Bibles and whatever, what, what not. And so God opened the door. I had been kind of knocking in a way for something that I could do for the kingdom. And here, God opened the door and said, here, why don't you work on concerts? I didn't know much about anything about setting up concerts. I hadn't organized any concert before. But I said, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. And so... Um, so the first meeting was pretty small. It was just like almost like let's, let's uh, figure out how we'll do this kind of thing. But that began uh, a set of concerts that we did about every month to every two months for over a year and a half. And there was another thing that I, I was interested in music. I wanted to, to write uh, music. And... Uh, mostly, like, I had been, as a, as a teenager, I had gotten into listening to, like, rap and stuff, and I stopped doing that when I cut off the worldly stuff, because most of the stuff I knew was all worldly when it came to rap music and things, and terrible, degenerate, uh, in which I didn't even, you know, like, I treated almost as a joke, because I didn't think that I should do those things, but uh, was listening to the, the beat and whatnot. But um, I didn't go and write, write music myself, but God gave me a platform to help others who were doing music for the Lord and were making uh, gospel rap or making all sort of different kinds of music. And he opened the door to be able to bring people together from different churches, different places to minister together in these concerts. And so uh, a lot of, there were a lot of youth there and, and it was like upbeat concerts that we'd ended in worship. And so we had a worship leader who would wor lead worship at the end and, and, um, and prayer. And God brought that about not without really, like, he didn't tell me ahead of time this was what he was going to do. And I, I feel a little, like I get emotional about it because really his plans are better than we could think. They're better than we could imagine. But we have to 
have our priorities set right. It would have never happened if I didn't, if, if I didn't want to give time to God with that time. It wouldn't have happened. So we should examine and think like, I know now I'm in a different phase of life. <laughs> I have four little kids and a lot less time, but I have a different ministry that's equally as important to raise these children to know the Lord and to raise, raise them uh, to, to seek the kingdom first. And many of us here that have little kids, we all have a ministry um, to them. We can think about what ways can we make ourselves and our families available to God and to seek him first and make that a direct purpose in our lives. All right. We have to be open. We have to be open to open to what God's will is. And sometimes that is going to be in conflict with what we want to spend our time on. I can see in my own life that it's like, well, I need to have resources in order to do certain things. And so sometimes I get focused on those resources that I need and getting the resources. Uh, and so my time goes to, well, how can I make you know, extra money so I'll have the resources to do these things? But I could spend a lot of my time doing that and not actually do things for the Lord. And so we need to have things in balance and to understand that if we're prioritizing, prioritizing God's kingdom, how can we ensure that we're still open to his will? So I can say, well, I'm going to give you some time, but what if giving the time, the things that I want and I think are not exactly the way that God wants? We have to be willing to yield, I guess is my point. On this next point, is uh, to, to, to talk about that willingness that we see in, in Jesus. And let's look at his example in Luke. I guess this is kind of like the ultimate example. In Luke uh, chapter 22 and Matthew 26. I have two places, actually. Let me see which of those I want to go first. Okay, here we go. Matthew 26, verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This is when Jesus was in the garden with his disciples, and he was so sorrowful because of the weight of sin, which was going to be poured upon him in the garden. And he had his, asked his disciples to watch and to wait, and they kept falling asleep. He went a, a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Sometimes God will give us uh, things to do that are not what we want to do at the time. But we have to shift and say, I'm going to stop and close this, this book, close this page, and I'm going to open up this other page of what God wants for me, and I'm going to accept that, even though it maybe is not, not pleasant. Or maybe it doesn't seem to, if we're focused on, like I said, sometimes we get focused on our next goal. And so we're thinking about that goal more than thinking about the bigger picture. But when God is speaking with that still small voice to us to say, should you be doing this? Should you, I want you to do this other thing. That we have to be willing to yield and not resist that. So when we look at Jesus' prayer it's the ultimate submission, the submission up to the point of death, really, because he knew what he was taking upon himself, the sins of us, of all of mankind, our sin. There's, despite that severe cost, he prioritized God's 
will, the will of his father over his will and over comfort or personal desires and wants. And so to have this, if we want to ask and receive and seek and knock, we need to also be open to God's will in that situation to receive his will and then we, then we will be asking according to his will. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So when we're aligning our will with his will, then we'll know that we'll be asking for the things that God has for us. We'll have confidence when we ask because we'll know that we're asking according to his will. When we spend time with God and do those things we discussed before and we yield to him, it will build faith in us to where we'll be able to believe I had mentioned uh, before that I started organizing, when I organized the con these concerts, I wasn't speaking very much, just a little bit at the beginning. Um, I wanted to kind of go and prepare things and maybe speak more myself or work on my own music, but that wasn't what God was saying that I should do. I felt that God was saying, you know, you need to focus your efforts on finding these other folks who already have done this and make a platform for them. And so, so I did. So I spent time and I listened to some of their music and I talked with some of them and found out who, would, who, who I would have at each event. Um, well, one, at a, one event at a time, basically, was doing that. But I, wasn't, I didn't have much time for myself. I was working full-time still, uh, which is like, you know, usually eight, eight to ten-hour days. And then I was going and um, meeting with people and listening to their music and talking with them and those sort of things. Um, but as I got to know them more, then God made, gave, started to give me a message for others too. And so that was when I wrote the, uh, the first song that I wrote. It was called Lift Your Brother Up. And it was about that, about um, lifting one another up, basically, when we see them seeking God and having his message to to um, get out of our own selfish ways and to lift our brother up. And so in the midst of uh, seeking him, then he, he gave me a message as well for others. And then another song he gave me too uh, about a month after that. This was probably after I had been doing the concerts for, I don't know, eight months, seven months, eight months in. Uh, and, and I wrote that song, that, the rap that you guys had heard, a lot of you have heard, Working for the King. <laughs> we, and it's about, too, it's about giving our energy, right? It's a real, really a lot about what this, this, this sermon is. It's not the same when you're working for the king. It says all things are possible with, with him uh, and for you because of what God has done. And so, um, but we need to ask him. We need to seek him and then yield to his will because if we just think, okay, we're just immediately going to get the thing we're asking the way that we think we're going to get it. If I hadn't, still kept spending time with God, if I had just gone away, okay, and not spent any time seeking God, then none of the things would have happened. But those things aren't there. Those things are there to show that he wants to have that relationship with us to where we can ask, and we know that he will. He will, uh, we will receive. We know these are this, his promise to us. We just have to stay in there with him, stay in that relationship with him, keep seeking him, and keep overcoming whenever we're fought back, when we're, with our own sin, with our own desires that aren't contrary to God, keep on getting back up if we stumble and fall. Let's continue now. Um, as we learn to embrace God's will, we should consider how he activates our faith and how he directs our plans. As we trust him more, he'll direct our steps 
and we become active participants with him. It's not, um, when we think about the people who believe God, they, ha- they had a promise from God and it required some action that they had to take. They couldn't just sit back. They had action to, to take in order to show their faith. And so when we, when we think about um, James and what James has said in chapter 2, he says, Thus also faith by itself, self, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? If <laughs> you think about it, if you go through what, we're, what I'm saying here about spending time with God and, and about yielding to his purpose, how would there not be any works? How will there not be something that God is doing? Because he's going to open the door. He's going to help you to find him. He's going to help you in, in the ways that you need that is going to result in action. I mean, even when we ask for things, generally speaking, uh, the things we're asking for are things that uh, will lead us into action. Verse 26, skipping down a bit. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we see that the accompaniment of these two things together, and for us, if we're asking for spiritual things, if we're asking for, um, for, for healing or for, some, for God to do some, uh, some miracle in our lives or for someone else, that there's, there's action as well to be done, to, to stand in faith. There's action to believe his promises, to go out and speak his words, to spend time with him is an action as well, to, like, to seek him, to wait upon him. And will lead to, these, uh, to, to the results that we're looking for. But oftentimes, um, that action that we're uh, seeing, sometimes we don't think waiting is an action. But think about Abraham. It says he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But that wasn't, wasn't that there was no action involved there because he had to wait a really long time, right? I mean, he didn't have the son until, you know, he'd already went on off with and tried to do it his own way with Hagar, or, and that didn't work out, and he had to wait a whole lot longer still. And so, um, but it, what it was was that it shows that believing, right, is not something that we just do once and then it's done. It's like, you believe and you keep believing and you keep believing and you keep believing and you keep believing and then the promise comes. So God will test us that way in our faith. And so when he said ask and seek and knock, we have to be perseverant. We have to have active faith by continuing to wait, by continuing to ask, by continuing to trust him, by continuing to seek him, by continuing to spend time with him. Now, uh, let's take a look at some of the promises that God has because God wants to show up for us, I believe. He wants to do many things through us, but oftentimes um, we're not ready yet, which is okay. We, by spending time with him, we get ready. But let's take a look at some of these promises that he has for us. Um, first, I want to go to John 9, though, and look at here, verse, I think I skipped over a couple of verses, but that's okay. Three through seven. Now, uh, the disciples had come to Jesus and asked if someone, for whose sin it was that this man was born blind. And in verse three, it says, neither this man nor his parents sin, uh, for neither this, this man's nor his parents sin, sin but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now when he said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with his saliva and he anointed the eyes of the man who was blind. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which was translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, I mentioned this verse because a couple things. One is that the works of God were the reason that this was to happen. And so God, when we're seeking first the kingdom, what is some of the things that God wants done? And it's the works, his works of the works, right? His faith without works is dead. The works of God are things that we are to, to, to do, right? And some of those things, um, we won't know them unless we spend time with God. And here, there was this man who was born blind, and they're asking him this question about it. And he tells them, it's the works of God that this would be done. So it's not like some, uh, some people look and they think, well, like, you know, God is not a, here that hear it spoken, God is not a genie, right? We just ask him, and then he gives us the things we want. But he wants to do things for his glory and, and for, his, uh, for his name. And here it says that the glory of God was revealed through this act. And he says that Jesus says there that he's working the works of him who sent him. And that he should work while it says the night is coming when no one can work. And, and he is the light of the world. So he, it's his, his works that he has for us to do. He is the light of the world. And his light is uh, what he says, you know, through baptism. He comes and he lives in us, right? And his light is in us. And here he did something very peculiar. He spit on clay and stuck it in somebody's eyes. It looked pretty strange. So sometimes things that God have us to do will look pretty strange. If somebody said, what, Jeff raps? And he, went and he organized rap concerts? Nobody growing up would have thought Jeff was going to go rap and organize rap con- gospel rap concerts. That, but it looks strange sometimes. Sometimes people, I still tell people, like people still look at me and they think, what, you rap? They don't think that I would rap. But because of, I guess, how I look or whatever. But so, but the, my point here is that we have to be open to doing things that are different. If we're hearing from God, he might ask us to do something strange. And we need to be willing to do it. Okay. Now, let's go, turn over to, after the disi- uh, Jesus sent out his disciples in two by two, he said this verse to them, which I believe is also for us. And in verse 18 through 20, it says in Luke 10, 18 through 20, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, speaking to his disciples there. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. So it's not like, let's, don't rejoice and have a power trip over, you've got all the power over everything now. But he said, rather that your name is written in heaven. Isn't that great? We're, we know that our names are written in heaven. We have this great thing to look forward to Why we're here now, celebrating this feast, looking to the fact that God is gonna be with us and we'll for, have spent forever with him. And isn't that awesome? And if some enemy wants to come against us, then who is that enemy that's going to come against us? We have the power to trample on those things. Why? Because we're focused on him. We're going we're gonna to go be with him. That's not going to stop us, the enemy that comes against us. And it's not that we, we have some things that, like really, I'd rather just not even need to deal with the enemy. But if he shows up, then look, I've got this promise. So we have these amazing promises. And to reemphasize that these things are for us. Let's take a look three times in John 14, 15, and 16. He repeats this over and over again. Um, and I'm going to read John 14, 12 through 14, John 15, 7 and 8, which is right after the part we talked about before, about abiding in him, and John 16, 23 through 24. So starting out, let's read John 14, 12 through 14. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
Now, there's a place also, I didn't write this one down, but it says a disciple is not as above his master, but everyone who's trained will be as his master. And so this isn't saying like we're going to be greater than Jesus, but it's saying that the works that he did, we will do also because he goes to the Father. And there he gives us that promise, if we ask anything in his name, I will do it. So it's not like that we have to muster something up in ourselves. It's about we need to spend time with God. We'd be connected to God, know his will, and then he will bring about these things. Because like what he said, he said when he went and spat on that ground and did that to the man, he said, what did he say before that? He said, I am uh, doing the things that I see my father doing, basically. He said, um, let me see, go back to it real quick. It's on my previous page. Okay, Um, lost my place. Oh, here it is, John 9, when he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. That's what I was looking for, that he is working the works of him who sent him. So it's not something like, okay, well, I need to do something amazing. It's that God is going to reveal to us the works that he has sent us to do. And so there's, it's not like, sometimes I used to think about this, well, if I could just, if I will get spiritual enough, right, if I do this, then, then, then I'll go and pray and God will do these things. But he's, it's not like, it's a relationship with him that I know to go and pray for the man because I see that God is leading me to do that. I'm not like trying to jump completely out of my, not that God won't call you out of your comfort zone. Look, if he tells me to put some mud on somebody's eyes, regardless of having heard, I'm still going to feel out of my comfort zone putting mud on the guy's eyes. But the point being that it's not like I have to go and make that happen. It's that I need to spend time with God, and then he'll, he will uh, direct me. So let's look, read the, this, the next one in John 15, 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And so as his disciples, we need to abide in him, spend that time with him. Um, and we, we don't need to judge or our, our look down at ourselves if we're not doing something. We just need to spend time with God. We just, we, and we're all here to encourage one another. We have time here uh, with one another and also, to, like I think as Adam was saying, let's find some time, find a little time with God. And let's do that because he wants us to ask the things that he's gonna put desires in us that are godly desires. He's gonna put desires in us that lead toward his kingdom. The more time we spend with him, the more that we have desires that align with his desires, the more that he reveals his will to us. Now, lastly, uh, John 16, 23, 23 and 24, it says, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked me nothing. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. And so he was saying that, you know, as he's going to the Father, and further on in 17, he prays for us, not just as the disciples, but he extends that this is for us, right? Because he said, I don't pray just for those who are here with me, not just the disciples, but he says he prays for all of us. Um, and so we may have to wait. We may not get uh, these things right away. But we will see God work through us if we will awaken to him in prayer, to seek him, and to knock on the door and say, what is it that you have me to do, Lord? Lord. Here I am. And when we arise in that we need to depend upon him, to, to look at that as not um, something, it's not that we're just going to get to a certain place and do things ourselves. We're just going to be so close and attached to him. When we awaken to this, to pray and, and arise to depend upon him and move from our own self-reliance to a life of dependence, 
and then seek his kingdom, then he will shine through us. And his, his light, that he's the light of the world, will fill us and we will shine because he, we, will, we will do those things which he's asked us to do. We awaken to God's will for our lives and the deeper purposes that he has for us. We know that we all have uh, this, a, a common calling to seek and build his kingdom, but there's different ways and purposes that he has for each of us. And when, we, uh, when we're seeking his will, when we're uh, willing to yield, then he'll make those purposes more clear. Sometimes he just drops them. I didn't really realize <laughs> that it was, he didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of for notice I was about to be asked to go and organize concerts. It just kind of dropped in my lap all of a sudden. And then was just trusting that God would make a way. I didn't have all the things I needed when I began. But we arise in, in, the, in having faith and stepping out to do it when he starts to put those things together for us. And we demonstrate the reality of what we believe through that faith and through, the, through our, our deeds. And God is able to shine through us, and he moves in, in response to his promises. We stand on his promises. We have, it's not our own, we, our, it's not anything we made up. We're just saying, God has said this, and I'm gonna continue to stand. I'm gonna continue to wait for the promise. So what are the ways in which we can have each day have the intention, start with an intention, an intention to meet the challenges that God has for us uh, if that day of uh, the problems that we're facing with faith, continuing to ask him, seeking him, and knowing that he's going to we're going to receive from him, knowing that he's going, we're going to find these answers that we're looking for, and just being at peace through that process. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians 4.13. So let's think about those things during this feast, and let's encourage one another, because we have a Savior who's already done the work. He's already paid for our sins, and he's got this calling for all of us equally, He's not, uh, it's not just for me, it's not just for you. It's, he wants to meet us where our faith is. So let's be encouraged and go out and ask and seek and knock.